Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is getting an early start pruning our roses. OSU wildlife ecologist Tim O'Connell has tips for feeding birds in the landscape. Casey has the simple science for keeping plants healthy. And we begin the process of cleaning up the garden to prepare for spring. often considered the queen of the garden. They're elegant, but some people tend to think that they might be a little high maintenance. And I think a lot of times when we're talking about pruning roses especially, people get a little bit anxious about what to do and when to do it for fear that they might damage or even possibly kill the roses. But really roses have come a long way and they're a lot more resilient than we might give them credit for. Now typically you want to prune most of your shrub roses in mid-March and that's because pruning roses can often cause new growth to come out and as we know in Oklahoma a lot of times we get late freezes and so that new growth is going to die back. But at the same time we are in Oklahoma and the weather is variable and so you can see here we already have some new growth coming on it and you really want to prune it before it takes off too much also. So when you're looking at a rose, you're looking at mainly maintaining its shape and its size because it's going to, again, increase throughout the growing season. When you start pruning, it's really best to use a pair of long-handled pruners or loppers, and that allows you to get into the shrub without scratching up your arms too much. Now, when we're looking at pruning hybrid teas, multifloras or um, polyanthas or floribundas, you really are going to look at pruning down to about a uh, 12 to 24 inch height, taking it all the way back to the ground to 12 to 24 inches. Now if it's a rose that you haven't pruned in several years, you might want to prune back to that upper end of 24 inches just so you're not cutting it back too much, too drastically, too soon. Um, so here we've got one. It's probably about three feet, tie, uh, three feet high. So we're going to try to take it back to some of these main branches down in here. And when you're pruning, you're going to want to open up the structure a little bit, make it more of an open canopy. And that allows for good airflow. So we're going to look to prune something. The um, first thing that you're going to want to prune is anything that's dead. So you can see we've got a couple of dead stems in here. And we're going to take those out first. So after we've cut anything dead, we also want to cut anything that is rubbing. And so you can see this branch here is rubbing on the one behind it because this one is going more towards the inside of the canopy of the rose. We're going to take out this one. Okay, so dead, diseased, and uh, damaged. So we've taken out the dead, we've taken out the damaged, and we fortunately don't have any diseased branches on here to remove. So the next thing we're gonna do is kind of reduce this back down to that 18 inches height. Um, and so we'll just start gradually taking some of this off. Um, and you can kind of see some of this is just the newer growth. And we'll do a lot of cleanup as we get closer in there and can see better. But we're just going to take it back um, to some of the branches that are about 18 inches. Again, you can use your loppers to kind of pull those out of the way a little bit in order to see what's going on in there. So as we get more and more of the bulk removed off of the plant, we're going to get in there with our hand pruners and do a little more detail work to clean up some of the smaller things. And one of the things that we want to look at are the buds as to guide us where we're going to make our cuts. So you can see they have alternate buds. Here it comes out this side and then it comes out the opposite side as you go up the stem, back and forth as you go. 
And what you're going to want to do is cut above a bud that is facing outward. So if we were to cut above this bud right here, this will initiate growing and cause it to grow in toward the middle of the shrub. Whereas if we cut above here, it's going to grow out, allowing for a more open canopy, which is important for good air circulation um, and reduce the potential for diseases. So again, here you've got your inward facing bud. This is going out. And so you'd make a 45 degree cut right above that bud. And it's really best to do it on an angle so that when you have any water, that's gonna run off instead of having it set right on a flat stem. All right, once you get into a manageable uh, height that you're really looking at establishing, you're also going to start looking at the center of it and take out some of the smaller, more spindly uh, canes. Anything that's less than the size of a pencil, you really want to go ahead and remove. So really, again, this is the best way to prune many of your shrub roses, your multiflora floribundas, polyanthas, and your hybrid tea roses. Again, taking them down to a 12 to 24 inch height. So for your old fashioned roses that you might have, they don't need a lot of regular pruning. Um, they tend to create their own natural mound. So you might just prune them occasionally to keep them back um, if you want to keep them in check a little bit. But the others prefer a yearly prune um, early in the springtime before they really start flushing out. Now on your climbing roses, those are a little bit different. Because they put a big flush of flowers in the springtime, you're gonna prune those after they bloom. And when you're pruning climbing roses, you're looking to remove the older canes, the large canes, and allow those newer canes to really develop because that's where you're gonna get the most flowers the following year. So you're going to want to go ahead and tie those or train them somehow to the arbor or trellis or the uh, structure that is supporting them. So regardless of what you're pruning, after you've pruned everything, you want to make sure to thoroughly clean and rake up any of the debris to prevent any diseases from continuing to grow on that new foliage that will soon be emerging. When you're pruning, again, don't be afraid to make multiple cuts on that same branch. It's always to cut, better to cut less than it is to cut too much. And then, of course, you can't re-glue things back together. So there are several times where you might just reduce it and then realize that you need to cut it even further. And that's okay. And make sure that you take a step back and look at it occasionally. I mean, you can see we've reduced this plant a lot and it looks a little drastic, but don't worry, it will come back. Even the queen of the garden needs a little tough love. Today we are joined by Dr. Tim O'Connell who is in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department and he is one of our bird experts. And Dr. O'Connell, you're here today to talk to us about some winter care for birds. Yes, I am. People we, love to feed birds. I do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it's kind of our interest in the garden that time of year mm -hmm. as yeah. well. So um, you brought with you some different foods. I know there's always some question about should I buy the expensive? What, what do birds want to eat sure, this time sure. of year? Sure, sure. So um, there are a bunch of things to consider. One of the things that's uh, really commercially available and pretty cheap would be a mix like that. Um, and this is probably how when most people are just starting to feed birds, that's, that's sort of what they'll do. Uh, but there's a lot of filler in here, and it's really not a lot of great uh, seeds for birds. Okay. For birds, the whole thing you're looking for, or what they're looking for, is a high fat content in the seed. And then a seed that they don't have to spend a lot of time cracking open to get that fat content inside. So um, 
more than this, I would recommend some uh, sunflower seeds. Okay. Now, sunflower seeds, you can get these great big gray striped ones, they call them, but those are pretty woody on the outside. And it's easy maybe for a cardinal to crack into that, but some of the smaller birds, it's not as easy. Right. So better is uh, what we call black oil sunflower seed. And that's the, the small sunflower seeds. They've got a really sort of soft husk and they're easy for uh, even chickadees or titmice to, or even goldfinches to get in there and then get that really nutritious um, sunflower heart. Uh, that's the part they're actually eating. Okay. All right. Yep. And for specialty uh, situations, maybe you've got a place where you don't want a bunch of sunflower husks accumulating on the, on the ground, you can just feed uh, sunflower hearts directly. So this is commercially available and this has the husks taken off. Okay, so the, the work's been done for them. Work's been done for Do they them. go through this a lot faster then? Or? They can. It's actually kind of funny. Sometimes they'll sit there and they'll still try to take the husk off because <laughs> that's just their sort Nature, of innate yeah. behavior. Um, but generally, they'll figure it out pretty quickly. And So this is, uh, this is nice uh, for a, a no-mess application, but it is a lot more expensive. Okay, yeah. and, and you've got some uh, non-seed <laughs> options here. <laughs> there are some non-seed <laughs> options. These are mealworms. These are dried mealworms, and these are commercially available now. And a lot of birds will eat these. Chickadees will eat them, nuthatches, wrens. Uh, but so most seed, people... seed eating birds will eat these. Is that correct? Yeah, a lot of those birds, uh, a lot of chickadees and, and wrens and things like that, they're really generalists. Okay. Uh, and, in, and in the summertime especially, they'll take a lot of insect food. Okay. That's mostly what they're feeding their babies. Uh, but other things like uh, bluebirds will mm -hmm. love to come to um, some dried mealworms. All so, right. Yeah. And, and can we mix these together? I mean, make a little trail mix for our birds? You, or You can do that. Okay. Yeah, you, the way I look at it is you can do kind of whatever you want okay. <laughs> um, but what I do for just uh, simplicity sake and for attracting the largest number of birds is just offer this uh, black oil as okay. my standard okay and then I'll you know throw out some peanuts or something like that just to, as a little treat a little extra treat sometime okay and so do we need to feed the birds this time of year or I mean are they dependent on on bird food no that we provide no birds have been here a lot longer than we have okay and they know how to find food and it's uh, it's natural foods especially where you've got a lot of great uh, you know native plants planted and native trees, you're going to have abundant foods available for your native birds. Okay. The other thing is uh, overwintering insects. So things like, uh, if you're looking, we've got some pine trees here with some nice sort of corrugated bark and underneath those flakes of bark there are a lot of overwintering uh, insects and spiders and other invertebrate foods. And that's what chickadees and wrens would have been eating historically. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I tell people, when, if you want to feed birds, do it for you because you want birds close to your house or you want to be able to, to see them and watch them, um, but the birds don't really need it. Okay. But if you do start feeding birds, keep going later into the winter and the early spring because that's when their natural foods are at their lowest availability. Okay. So they've kind of created that habit that you're providing it and then you don't want to leave them high and dry in the middle. Kind of a jerky thing to do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Them in, the old classic bait and switch. Noted, noted. Yeah. Okay, so of course, uh, are there different types of feeders for these different things or what have you found to be the best option for do, that? You can spend a lot of money on fancy feeders. Mm -hmm. uh, you can spend a little bit of money on really cheap feeders. But no matter what, they're all going to fall down. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so what I look for is something that when it falls is not going to break. So this is a design that I found, again, that's com commercially available that I really like. And, and the you thing just I, got this at a local store here? Yep, or? just okay. at local stores Feed here store? in, in Stillwater. Yep. Okay. And uh, it's all metal construction and it's real sturdy. This is marketed as a peanut feeder. Okay. Uh, and you can feed peanuts if you want. That gets a little expensive. <laughs> well, but I just put my sunflower seed in here and it works great. Um, birds that can cling to things will come and just take one seed at a time usually. Chickadees will do that, uh -huh. chipmice will do that. Um, so they'll take one seed, fly off to a branch and then open up the seed there and then come back. So they eat one at a time and the seed lasts in there a good long time. Um, but of course what's going to happen is a squirrel is going to get over here <laughs> and the squirrel is going to open this lid and reach in and, and get a snack. So, uh, so at some point, this is going to fall down, and you just want to make sure you, it's still going to be workable after uh, you pick it up. The but it's next pretty day heavy duty. It's heavy duty, right? So, are, you mentioned birds that will be able to cling to the side of that. Are there birds that like to kind of roost on a, a stick or something? And could you put a, a stick between there to kind of allow them to do that? Yeah, it's, you could. And then uh, there's some uh, there's some things we'll call seed tray that you'll stick on the bottom okay. of this, so it'll be a um, chance for something like uh, or a goldfinch or a house finch. They'll sometimes like to just sit there. Okay. And uh, and take the seed rather than take one at a time. All right. But you know, as you're indicating, birds feed in different ways, and some of them really, like a morning dove, is never going to come and cling to a feeder that's okay. hanging. They feed from the ground. 
Um, so I always also spread some seed on the ground okay. you know, to make sure I'm feeding the widest variety of species that are there. Excellent. So yeah. what kind of birds are we seeing this time of year? And will they be around in the summer or they migrate and they're just here in the winter time? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> right? So um, here at the garden, we've had a wonderful uh, hour or so looking around at the birds coming into the, the uh -huh. feeders here at the garden. And that includes uh, local species that are here year round. Uh, Carolina chickadee, tufted titmouse. They're here eating uh, from our feeders in the winter. And then come the breeding season for them, it'll be sort of April or May. Uh, they will switch over to an almost completely insect diet for the summer. Okay. Uh, and that's what they're generally feeding their babies. Okay. Others, we were looking at Harris's sparrows. Mm -hmm. Harris's sparrow is this wonderful big sparrow. It's almost as big as a cardinal. And they breed way up north in Canada. And they winter here in the southern plains. So you find them in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, and they will come to your feeders. And um, so that, that's an example of a species that you really are probably helping a little bit by providing it some substance in the, in the wintertime. What about cedar waxwings? I know we mentioned those earlier. So everybody loves cedar waxwings. <laughs> and, and here in Oklahoma, we typically see them in the winter. Okay. And especially when they're sort of moving through in late winter. They typically don't breed in our state. They're, they're more of a farther north breeder. Okay. So you get them in the wintertime moving around with roving flocks of American robin and there's usually a few yellow rump warblers in there. And these are all species that will eat fruits in the wintertime. Cedar waxwings are looking for fruits that have um, reached a point at which they're more palatable. Uh, for some of our hollies, maybe that's not till later in the winter after they've been through a few frosts. And that can make them more easily to digest. Sometimes that actually builds up their alcohol content <laughs> and you get some drunk waxwings. Oh, no. um, but yeah, that's really what they're looking for. They're sort of hitting different fruits at different points throughout the winter. All right. Well, thank you for all of this information. It's been great. I'm always happy to do it. It's February and likely you or someone you know is coughing and sneezing. Hopefully that's the extent of your symptoms, but we are in the middle of the flu season. <laughs> Just like there are certain things that we do to prevent catching the flu, there's also certain things that you can do to prevent plant diseases from, from spreading in your garden. The first thing is to be knowledgeable about the diseases and also the symptoms so that you can correctly identify these as soon as possible. A great resource is to go to your local county extension office. You can simply take a part of the specimen or some photographs in for identification. If they are not able to help you with a confident identification of what might be wrong with your plant, they'll send these samples or the photographs off to the Plant Disease and Insect Diagnostic Laboratory here at OSU. Consider this like going to your general practitioner and them not being able to confidently identify what might be wrong with you and they send you to a specialist. However, we hope that it doesn't get to this point. And just like there's precautions that you can take for your own health safety, there's also precautions that you can take in the garden. <laughs> the first step is avoidance. Just like in the flu season, we avoid crowded, confined spaces so that we don't catch other people's germs. In the garden, we want to make sure that we space plants out and that we also don't put plants in a location where we know there's been disease problems prior. Another thing is that often diseases with plants happen at particular times or due to environmental conditions. You can prevent this by planting the plant earlier or later. Another thing to keep in mind is you want to make sure that you're going into your garden season with a clean bell of health. So any plants that you introduce into your garden, you want to make sure they're disease free. Just like when we have new babies, we often isolate them in order to make sure they're getting off to a strong start. Or maybe you have a friend that's had flu-like symptoms and we've often told those people to stay at home. 
We often do this with plants as well by quarantining them. We'll often take plants and set them aside in order to monitor any symptoms or to ensure that they don't develop any symptoms before we introduce them to the larger plant population. While it might seem that some people are just more prone to get sick, the same is true with plants. There are certain plants that more, are more susceptible to catching diseases. Now, some plants might also reflect that they have more resistance. Resistance is not the same thing as immunity. Therefore, you want to make sure to maintain the plant's overall health because if the health of the plant declines, so does the resistance, especially under stressful conditions. Just like the doctor says, stress affects your health as well. In the plant world, it's very hard to actually cure plant diseases. So really, we're looking at preventing the spread of those diseases onto healthy plants. We often look at the environmental conditions that might make certain plants more susceptible to certain diseases during that time. At that time, that's often when we start applying fungicides and bactericides in order to protect healthy plants. We also might use physical barriers, such as cloth, to drape over plants in order to prevent insects that often carry these diseases from getting to our plants. This is like, as people, we often use hand sanitizers and facial masks to prevent the spread of germs. While all of this might seem overwhelming as we're in the midst of flu season, as we enter our gardening season, we want to make sure to keep all of this information in mind. It's important to be knowledgeable about the plant diseases and their symptoms. Therefore, you can have early detection and quick response to reduce the impact on your plants and your garden. It's about that time to start cleaning our perennial garden. Usually we want to do this in late February into March. It kind of depends on when and how mild our winters have been and when our spring wants to show up. When you start to see that new growth emerge, that's when you want to go ahead and prune and remove a lot of that old growth, that dead growth that still might be remaining. A lot of times we leave that through the winter months to add winter protection and just to help uh, insulate it from those freezing conditions. But at this point, as we can start to see there's some new green growth coming on, we're going to remove a lot of this dead because we don't want to wait too long. If we do, we run the risk of cutting that new growth coming on. So you can see here, we have some, a lot of different perennials. They completely die back to the ground. And you can see, this is a helianthus. I mean, we've got four foot, five foot tall stems here that have died, and that's how much it's gonna grow each season. But we wanna go ahead and remove this. Um, and for this particular plant, it's best to use loppers because it's got some pretty thick diameter uh, stems on it. So we're just going to go in there and clean this out. You can see here the basal growth that is starting already. So you're going to have a lot of plant debris. Um, you might even consider wearing a dust mask or something depending on how much you're allergic to pollen um, and just seeds because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be stirring in the air when you do this. So this is one example um, with the helianthus. Here we've also got some daylilies that you can see have a lot of old growth coming around them still. Um, and so that you can either use a leaf rake or just your hands to kind of go in there and clean that up a little bit. Um, a lot of this, if it lays on the ground, it's fine, but we want to make sure to remove that out of the middle to allow for those plants to continue to grow. Now something that has a smaller stem, uh, such as this solidago or goldenrod, again, you can kind of go in there and just break it with your hands if you want. Best to use gloves because they can be kind of sharp um, and cut you. Or you can use something like these uh, hand shears and just go in and trim it. Basically, we're giving the garden a big haircut. And of course, as you're doing this, depending on how large your garden is, you can have a lot of organic matter left over, but all of this is great material to add to your compost pile. As you go through, sometimes you need to go ahead and just rake it all out of your way so you can see what still might be remaining that you need to cut. And you can see there are certain leaves that are in here and just other debris, and it's nice to go ahead and remove that. 
And of course, some of your perennials, such as um, phlox and some low-growing ground covers, really the best way to uncover those is by using a leaf rake and just getting some of that debris off the top of them. The nice thing about trimming back your perennial garden is you have plenty of time to do it if you start again kind of end of February going into March. We have plenty of time to get all of this done and so it really doesn't have to be a go out and get it all done and break your back and sweat. Just take advantage of those nice winter days that we still have remaining and get out there and get that garden ready to go for next spring. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. We will not air during our regular time over the next three weeks on the main OETA channel to make room for spring fundraising but you can find a special Best of Oklahoma Gardening episode on OETA World and on our YouTube channel. We hope you consider supporting OETA during their pledge drive and be sure to join us back here March 21st for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.